Today we're going to look at reflections of light in mirrors. Turns out light travels in straight lines and we have some very good everyday evidence of this. That is the fact that we get sharp shadows. So when light is bouncing around a room and going in every direction we don't get sharp shadows. But when light is coming from a single source such as the sun, when it hits an object it leaves a sharp shadow and it will be in the same shape as the object except for some stretching due to the angles involved. So if light didn't travel in straight lines we wouldn't get these sharp shadows. As it turns out light reflects in a way that's very similar to the way tennis balls reflect. So if we take a tennis ball and we throw it off a nice smooth surface like a wall it will come in and we're not spinning the ball, it's just coming straight in. It would bounce in approximately this direction here. Now light behaves the same way. If instead of a tennis ball we've got a source of light, say a flashlight, we've got a beam of light or a light ray coming in and then a light ray going out, we would usually call this ray coming in, we'd call that the incident ray. This ray coming out we'd call the reflected ray. This here would be a smooth surface for the light and typically that means we're talking about a mirror. And if we draw a line perpendicular to the mirror here, right where the reflection occurs, we'd call that line the normal. And then we'd talk about two angles, this angle here called the angle of incidence and this angle here called the angle of reflection. And we have something called the law of reflection. And it, that simply says that this angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So that's the law of reflection. Symbolically, we'd write the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. Now, of course, if this surface here is bumpy like a piece of paper, we'd get what's called diffuse reflection. And just like with a tennis ball, we wouldn't know where the ray would go. It would be unpredictable. So let's see if you understood that and can draw what's called a ray diagram. So that's where you draw the incident rays, the reflected rays, and the normals. So I've drawn two incident rays, one on a mirror and one on a spherical mirror. Pause the video, complete the ray diagrams, and come back for the answer. So let's start by drawing our normals. Quite easy on the first one. We just need a line that's going to be perpendicular to the mirrored surface that goes through the point where the incident ray strikes the mirror. Now with the spherical surface, we need a, a line that comes out perpendicular to the surface of the sphere at that point. And any line that comes from the center of a circle will always cross perpendicular to the surface. So what we need is a line from the center of the circle going through that point of contact. So we've now drawn our normal lines here and here. Now for the reflected lines on this one I just need a line coming this way approximately like that such that this angle here is the same size as this angle here. And then I do the same thing over here. So I need to make this angle of incidence the same size as the angle of reflection over on this side. So it should look approximately like that. Incident ray, reflected ray, incident ray, reflected ray. So how is it that we see an object? Well, let's take a single point on this flame here. From that single point, there would be light rays coming out in all directions, including directions that are into and out of the screen. And there'd be a small range of angles in here that would strike the iris over here. So let's draw two rays just to represent those rays that would be striking the iris, something like that. Now behind the iris is a lens 
and the lens causes those rays to come together, to converge. And they'll meet at a point at the back of the eye. The back of the eye is like a projector screen. It's called the retina. So as all the cells are firing on the back of the retina, the brain is continually making up an image. And so our brain gives us this, this visual sense of the world because all of these cells on the back of the retina are firing. And the brain is able to interpret this and we see a meaningful image. Now what's kind of interesting is the eye really only knows the rays as they strike its surface. They really don't know what's going on back here with the rays. Suppose the light had come from a point over here and taken some strange path to get to the iris, something like that. The brain is not going to map this point on the retina to this point in space. It's still going to map this point on the retina to this point in space. Because the brain builds the image based on the idea that all the rays coming into the iris were traveling in a straight line. So why is it that the eye sees an image in behind the mirror? Let's consider a single point of light emanating from our source. Rays would go in all directions. Let's choose two rays coming out almost parallel here, but of course they're going to diverge. And they continue to diverge after they do reflection and the light strikes the eye. The eye then sees the image based on the idea that it reconstructs the image as if these rays had come in straight and emanated from a point. So if we trace these rays back, we find that they cross each other somewhere out here. And so we're going to get an image formed where the two lines intersect, somewhere here. I'm a little bit off, but if I'd done it correctly, the distance, the perpendicular distance from this point to the mirror would be exactly the same as the perpendicular distance from the mirror to this point on the image. So these two lengths would be the same. So the image is formed directly across from the object at an equal distance behind the mirror as the object is in front of the mirror. Now if we want to draw an image of an object in a mirror, we don't have to go through this complicated ray diagram. We can just use this very simple idea that any point on the image will be located behind the mirror the same perpendicular distance as the object point was from the mirror. So if we call this distance d here, it's a certain length, then we've got to draw something exactly the same distance here, perpendicular from the mirror, and that will locate the image point. And now we can choose another point and do exactly the same thing. We draw a perpendicular from the mirror to the point. Let's call this one L. And then we draw another line exactly the same distance. And once again, it's got to be perpendicular to the mirror. So the bottom of the candle on the object would show up as the bottom of the candle on the image over here and we can draw our candle in for the image. It's going to look something like that. Now we like to characterize images and we do that with an acronym SALT. S is for size, A is for attitude, 
L is for location and T is for type. So in a mirror you can see here that the image is the same size as the object. When we look at spherical mirrors we'll get images that can be larger or smaller than the object. Attitude is just whether or not the image is upright or inverted. Here we can see that the bottom of the candle is near the bottom of the page and the top of the candle is near the top of the page for both the image and the object so that we would consider to be upright. In terms of location the image is located the same distance behind the mirror. Really the same distance behind the mirror as the object was in front of the mirror. And for type, there's two types of images. This image is what we call a virtual image. We get virtual images when the rays diverge as they enter the eyes and the image is formed where there's no actual light. There's no actual rays of light in behind the mirror here. So there's no real rays at the image. For a real image, you'll have real rays of light intersecting with each other. Let's summarize the big ideas from the video. We first saw that light travels in straight lines. And then we say that light kind of bounces like a tennis ball obeying the law of reflection so that the incident ray when it strikes off a smooth surface like a mirror will reflect such that this angle here the angle of incidence between the incident ray and the normal here will be equal to this angle of reflection from the normal to the reflected ray. So angle I is equal to angle R. We saw that the I-brain system assumes light entering it originated on a straight line path. So if the light actually reflects, then we're going to see objects in kind of strange places. We also saw that the image in mirror is located, and I think a drawing works a little better here, if we take any, ob any point on an object, then this perpendicular distance from the mirror to the point on the object will be exactly the same as the distance from the mirror, the perpendicular distance from the mirror to the image. So here's your image and here's your object. And we can do that for every single point on the object. And finally, we saw that we could characterize images according to SALT, S-A-L-T. S is for the size of the image. Is it the same as the object, bigger than the object, or smaller than the object? A is for attitude. Is the image facing the same direction as the object, or are they inverted to one another? L is for location. In the case of a mirror, we would talk about the location being the same perpendicular distance from the mirror to the object as the mirror to the image. And T is for type, which can be either real or virtual. In a mirror, we've got a virtual image because there's no real light behind the mirror. And the rays diverge into the eye. In other cases, you'll see that there'll be real rays of light intersecting to form an image. And that'll be a real image.
And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.